Welcome. So I'd like to start with this situation. If I would walk out of this hogeschool and I would be hit by a car, we take it for granted that we would receive the right critical care, the right acute care. We would have the right care at the right place by the right person at the right time. But in the northern part of the Netherlands, it's starting to become like not, not like a normal thing to have this, to have the right care at the right place at the right time when it's about acute care. This is because the northern Netherlands, Groningen, Friesland and Drenthe, is underpopulated, is unpop uh, 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 well, less populated uh, uh, than, the, uh, than The Hague and the western part of the Netherlands. We have an aging population. And what we had is what, uh, we had two emergency departments closed down. So, and of course, because of that, we have an overcrowding of our emergency departments. Let's see. The current status quo, if you're calling 911, that results into a ride into the emergency department. And that results in 40% of patients arriving at the emergency department that could have been helped by another caregiver. And our deepest desire in this, and for, for which we hope uh, you, can, you can help and you can add to the challenge, is that we keep patients that do not belong in the emergency department out of the emergency department. So this is not just like only this hackathon. This is part of a, a bigger uh, a pilot, called, uh, a pilot care coordination uh, with all different kinds of stakeholders that Thea will, uh, will later on uh, tell us about during the Q&A. And what we want to say is that there's a broader thing that you need to do to ensure that you get the right care at the right time by the right person. But currently, this project only focuses on capacity. Is there enough capacity? Are there enough doctors or, and beds at the certain places where we need to, to perform acute care? So it's not about the triage, it's not about uh, uh, um, choosing which care path to take, it's only about capacity planning. So what is the challenge? Create a co coordinating infrastructure that supports all entry points of the acute care system to enable every patient to receive the best acute care path at the right time and the right place, from the right caregiver given the available resources. That's like a lot, but well, I think you're smart and you can come up with beautiful solutions. So it's about this. It's like the Oprah thing. Everyone gets healthcare. And what we want to do is not only have like only this hackathon um, at the University Medical Center uh, and uh, in Groningen. We already have like lots of uh, experience with um, doing this Odyssey hackathon. So it's embedded in a larger plan, where of course this is the connect. Then we'll do a selection of the team. You'll have a video call uh, where you can ask Q&A, so the teams that are selected um, uh, can have a question and answer session through a video call. We'll do a face-to-face -face meeting at the University Medical Center of Groningen. We'll uh, have an accelerate one. This is very small, I should have planned this better. We'll, um, and then, of course, we'll have the hackathon weekend. But after that, you'll have the Accelerate brunch on the Monday. Um, then, at the University Medical Center or somewhere, somewhere else, we'll have the Accelerate meetup with stakeholders, with the different stakeholders involved. And then, of course, a set of custom steps to bring this project further. And during uh, the coming months, we'll be making a, a, a toolbox containing all kinds of background information, legal information, data sets, the right experts, and all these other things that you need. So based on what I just said, are there any questions? No, I'm just going to start with introducing Afke. I would like to have uh, here Afke Boersma. She's a policy offer at the GOR. This is, who of you are actually not from the Netherlands? Like, Gor, it almost, uh, it, it, I thought it sounds like a Star Trek, so like a Star Trek people, the Gor. But she's actually from the Gor. 
uh, and she'll explain what it is. But please, Afka, can you uh, can you join us? So let's see. I'll give you a microphone. Yeah. So uh, please um, introduce yourself and what's your function at uh, the Geneeskundige Hulpverleningsorganisatie in the regio. Yes, uh, dus I'm Afke Boersma and I'm a policy <laughs> officer of the GOR. I work for the, I work for the safety uh, region and for the department GOR. And uh, the department GOR is responsible for the uh, um, uh, processes of acute care and uh, public care during a uh, disaster and uh, crisis. Uh, so each institution uh, that uh, delivers care it has an own responsibility to uh, take care of all the patients, even when there's a disaster or a crisis going on. But uh, our role is to oversee the whole acute uh, 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 sector. And um, now yeah, when needed, we can uh, intervene. But uh, then we have one thing that's very important, and that's to have the right information. And now all the information is in uh, each institution itself, but there's no overview over the total uh, sector. As, uh, for my work, uh, this uh, challenge is very important because it provides us the information we need uh, to uh, coordinate uh, during disaster and crisis. And, and when I think of emergency care, acute care, my first instinct is to think about ambulances and emergency departments. What other um, uh, organizations are involved in this uh, GOR? Uh, in the GOR we have the um, uh, GGD, the, uh, the Director of Public Health uh, uh, has some uh, public health uh, uh, things. Uh, we have the psychological help. Uh, we have uh, the practitioners. Yeah. So there are lots of parties uh, we have involved uh, during crisis to deliver care. And why, from a uh, perspective of the uh, of the GOR, is it yes. important for you to participate in this and to to be part of this challenge? Um, it's important to uh, be a part of the challenge because uh, uh, what I told the information for us is uh, really important to uh, to be able to coordinate and deliver the people in the, our region the right care at the right time. Yeah. And I'm living in the region, so uh, I benefit from that. <laughs> Are you uh, living like in, in a very unpopulated region of the... In f in yes, in a small village, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Have a seat and then I'll ask our next panel uh, person. Let's see. Oh, Vika, we, we put you at, at the end, but... Well, Wieke Paulusma, she's the project leader of the Ommelander Ziekenhuisgroep. And of course, I googled this, a municipal councillor uh, in Groningen of D66, Democrats 66. Yeah. That wasn't important. <laughs> no, 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 but well, it's, uh, it gives a bit of, bit of context. Yeah, that's well. right. Uh, but I'm here today because I'm working at the Ommelander Ziekenhuis in Scheemda. Uh, we're one of the, no, we're the only one left in the region, uh, a small hospital in the region, uh, and we're providing healthcare to a very large population, a very sick population, because in the eastern part of uh, the Netherlands, people have a lot of chronic diseases, uh, and that sometimes escalates, uh, well, not only sometimes, that escalates a lot of the time, so our emergency department uh, is very busy, and we got even more busy because we're uh, providing healthcare for the uh, uh, hospitals that closed. So the two emergency departments that close in our area, all those patients come to our hospital. Uh, and I think we have the same challenge, like Afka said. Um, we don't know uh, if there's place in a hospital nearby. We don't know uh, which ambulances are coming uh, on the way. We don't know where we can bring patients if they're not uh, necessary to be at our emergency department anymore. Um, we have a small, a very good uh, line with the University uh, Hospital in Groningen because we are like a daughter of that organization, so that's a good connection. Uh, but with the rest of the northern part of, of Holland, we don't have it. Uh, and that's not only very uh, bad for people working in healthcare because it's a lot of frustration if you don't know where to go with your patients and you're waiting, waiting, waiting. Uh, but I think it's even worse for inhabitants in this part of Holland because we 
can't assure that you get the best healthcare at the time when you need uh, when you need it the most. Wow. And so after this hackathon and after this um, pilot around care coordination, when would you be like uh, pleased? Like, what would be a success? Well, for us, it would be very helpful if we would know where there are empty beds, and that sounds very simple, but that's a very uh, big problem. Uh, but for me, the dream goes uh, further on because I don't only want to be um, able to see where are the empty beds, but also where there is a nurse working in a village uh, who has time to take care of the patients that we want to send home because the worst place you can be is in a hospital and not because we deliver bad care, uh, but it's safer, healthier, and most of the time nicer for people to stay in their own homes. Uh, so I would like to make the connection with the inf informal, yeah, informal uh, care networks and not only with the hospitals uh, because uh, we're not doing it with hospital care only. Uh, we don't have enough staff so we have to make the connection with other forms uh, of care. So not only like the, the formal forms of care but also if you could dream you would also have like insight in, in capacity of informal caretakers. Yeah, yeah. there are a lot of... Um, uh, burger initiative? Citizen <laughs> initiative? Citizen sourcing. Citizen sourcing. Nice, nice. Uh, very powerful communities in the northern part of uh, the Netherlands, and I think we should use their experience, uh, their care uh, abilities to take care of each other. Uh, and yeah, right now we're not using them and we're not appreciating them enough. So for me, the dream goes uh, Even further, further than, than only the white jackets. Okay, thanks. Take a seat. Christian's for you later. Um, uh, uh, no, Bas, I would like to love to invite you on stage. Um, Bas, you're the a technical data manager at Lifelines. Yes. Can you explain a bit about Lifelines and about your role and even your role in the, yeah, in the hackathon? Yes, of course. Uh, so I'm indeed a technical data manager at Lifelines. Lifelines is an organization uh, in the northern region of the Netherlands uh, which is a biobank that collects data and biomaterial uh, from over 160,000 participants in this region. All of these participants are volunteers. Um, and we are supporting this challenge from a more technical perspective. At Lifelands, we deal with a lot of data that we're using for research on healthy aging. We have less to do with the primary posts of acute care, uh, but uh, in the sense of the mission from Lifelands, for example, and also the province as a whole, Healthy aging in general is a very important spear point. Um, and in that sense, we, we really support this, uh, this challenge. Uh, Life has also participated in the Odyssey Hackathon uh, two years ago with a challenge in empowering patients to provide data via, for example, uh, blockchain facilities. Um, and yeah, since this, in this challenge, uh, what we're seeing also is that there will probably be a lot of challenges in connecting and pairing data. Uh, we also see that the lifelines, uh, we have a large collection of data from these participants, uh, but there are also uh, other sources from which this data can be combined. For example, from, for example, the CBS is an important data source for lifelines as well. Um, but here, what you'll see in this process is that you have to do, uh, deal with the hospital, for example, with the GP, uh, with uh, other care providers, uh, and that as a whole, should provide a, a complete picture to determine the best uh, care path and also give insights into the capacity uh, of where a patient can be brought to. Thanks. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Have a seat. Yeah. Thea Martic, I would love to have you on stage. Thea is uh, advisor of crisis management and acute healthcare, yeah. AZNN, yeah. Acute Zorg Network Noord Nederland. Uh, and uh, please tell a bit more about uh, AZNN and uh, what your role is at the, at the hackathon. Uh, so in the Netherlands, we have 11 trauma centers. Trauma centers are other hospitals that can um, give the right care to every single patient that needs it. Every um, trauma center has its acute network. We are one of the no networks, um, the northern one. Uh, it entails Groningen, Friesland and Drenthe. Um, we started a pilot last week, the Pilot Coordination Center, because when someone calls 911 or in Dutch 112, the patient automatically enters the system and ends up in the emergency department. 
40% of these people could have been helped elsewhere. So we want to start a, a pilot with three, three chapters. The first chapter is um, multidisciplinary triage. Um, we want to have more people looking at the um, question of the patient, not only the um, ambulances, but also the home care, um, the mental health care, the first residences to um, assess the question the patient has. I, I was wondering, tri tri triaging? Does anyone not know what, it, what triaging is? Triage? Because, triage, because it, it might be, yeah. Okay, good, then, then maybe you As can... Ex assessing um, the patient's need. So um, seeing what's wrong and uh, assessing where he needs to go. That's triage. Uh, the second chapter of our um, pilot is choosing a right care path because um, the emergency departments are not the only way to go when someone comes with an acute care um, question. So maybe um, we, can we can give um, home care. Uh, the last chapter is the capacity, which is um, part of our challenge. Um, make a smart tool that gives all the capacity points. Um, you also have to think about the definition of capacity. It's not only um, beds, as in hospitals, it's also where is your staff? If you need home care, can you get, um, find the right staff at the right place and send the person to the patient? Um, we do this with multiple stakeholders. Um, the pilot has started in all three provinces. The challenge will focus on the province of Groningen with three um, hospitals, the University Medical Center, um, Ombelander Ziekenhuisgroep and the Martini Hospital. Um, we work together with the regional ambulances um, because they will use this um, tool the most. We also work with the GOR from uh, AFKE, um, the municipality of Groningen. Uh, the province of Groningen is also attached to our um, to our challenge because we all have the same uh, goal and that's giving the right care to the patients. Uh, the University of Groningen is attached as well and the University of Applied Sciences, so we have many stakeholders um, with the same goal. Good. I had lots of questions, but you answered them I'm like... I'm so sorry. Uh, no, that's very good. <laughs> that's very good. You, you already answered them, so that's, okay. that's very complete. So... Um, we need your help. And I can, well, I can see that there, there might be questions also from you. Let's see. I'll stand here. Um, yeah, I have a question to, to all of you combined, because you're talking about very qualitative <coughs> uh, things like giving better care, giving better infrastructure. But what are the quantitative um, things that will happen if uh, there won't be desired solutions, such as financial risk? Uh, what will be the impact of the northern province if something will not work out? Uh, for us, it means that we are not helping all the people that come to our hospital because it's we're having like uh, a queue <laughs> in front of our emergency uh, emergency department, and we don't have more doctors. So the doctors that are helping on the emergency department with more and more people that are coming to our hospital that could have been helped somewhere else then those doctors are not operating, are not helping people change their lifestyle. Uh, a lot of, it's very important for the northern part of Holland, there is a very big population with people with diabetic, with uh, diabetes? Di diabetic. Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, and we should help them with their lifestyle, not giving them medicines, with, but helping them with, with their lifestyle. But we don't have time to do that because we're getting more and more people at the hospital, so we're not doing, on the other side, the right things to keep people uh, healthy. So it will be financial, uh, I think that would be a disaster, uh, because healthcare costs in Holland, and I think everywhere, are rising and rising and rising. We have to do more about lifestyle and about your health and uh, everything to prevent uh, diseases, and we're not, we're not having time for that right now. As well, yeah, yeah. A, uh, yeah, it's a sad example, but uh, this happened like two two weeks ago in my hometown, Stadskanal, which is in, uh, in the eastern part of Groningen. Uh, a, a girl was stabbed, uh, but that was actually like 200 meters from the hospital in Stadskanal. And what we're seeing as well is that that's the other side of the story, and it also has to do with costs. Uh, for that hospital, the acute care department was shut down. So she was stabbed, but she couldn't be helped over that uh, in that hospital. So she had to go to a different hospital, um, a few kilometers uh, even farther away. 
So that was yeah, a very solid, solid example of, well, the thing that's also mentioned in the beginning, uh, that care in this area, in this region, uh, well, yeah, it's not a given uh, per se. So, yeah. so what's, you said a few kilometers. What's the nearest uh, hospital with an emergency department from Stadskanaal? I think it's around 30 or 40? Yeah, 30, 30 kilometers. 30 kilometers. Yeah. This, this, yeah. You, now you're making it sound like we're th this a total backcountry, but yeah? but yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, the first nearby trauma center for us is Zwolle, so it's uh, also one hour away if we really have trauma patients from Groningen to Zwolle, so an hour. Wow. Mm -hmm. If you would, uh, sorry, sorry. No, no. If you would um, have to choose between a technical solution or a social solution, you know, awareness program or a way to kind of mobilize the community, which aspect of those things do you think is most important? Yes, a technical. The yeah. oh, yes, of course. Sorry. I will, I will hand out. Do we have like an extra um, mic? So, okay. Sorry. Good. I'll, um, yeah, I'll have one um, mic. Mm -hmm. So if you can choose between a technical solution or a more social focused solution, what would it be? Is, am I phrasing your... And why? Good. But, but does it have to be a choice? Can't we do both? <laughs> yeah, where's the emphasis? I think a technical solution should also always be a social solution and hopefully the other way around as well. And I think maybe, Thea, it's part of a larger uh, pilot around care coordination where there's also, I think, awareness programs. Could you, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, Definitely, the challenge is only focusing on a technical solution because we already have groups focusing on the other solutions within the pilot. So multidisciplinary um, assessing, assessing of the um, of the patients, and that's also awareness about that. Not only um, you can only receive receive um, the right care in an emergency department, we also have other points that give even better care for your <coughs> acute care um, question. So that's also the awareness. Okay, so I can can I uh, summarize it? The focus of this challenge is really technically focused. Good. And I'm going to hand over the mic. Thank you. Um, I was wondering. Uh, you say uh, you miss the data uh, at one sort of um, center uh, source, mm -hmm. but is the data already there uh, at uh, different spots? I mean, do the hospitals know exactly um, what the resources are? Um, we've started another pilot um, last year. It's called 224. That's an, uh, a dashboard with all live capacities of the emergency departments in our region. It's also a pilot, so we are working on it this coming two years to see if it works, but that's only the emergency departments. Um, the first eight residences also have their own dashboards per province. Um, the problem is the dashboards are in the hands of the institutions themselves, so they can decide whether they have capacity or not. So. That's also a tricky question because they can also um, add to their capacity that they're not, uh, not available because they simply don't want to have another patient, even though they have the capacity. So our challenge is adding all those dashboards to each other so we have one big dashboard with all the acute care points in it. Yeah, so the, the, the data at the sources is probably also not um, at the right quality no. that you wanted. Okay. Maybe maybe I can add to that from a technical perspective as well because uh, looking at this technically, I also saw one of well the biggest challenges uh, for this case. Uh, if we're looking at a protocol, it really needs to also facilitate adoption of these different parties. So, for example, 224 is a very good example. They have an open API. You can just Google this and you can see what is available for uh, well their uh, what they facilitate is a sort of two-hour uh, forecast of bedding. This is something I think should be well, is, is really helpful for the hackathon weekend as well. And besides that, I think we, and that's also something for the toolbox, I think, should also facilitate sort of data sets from all these other parties so that you have an idea of how to combine, for example, this 224 data set with other data sets. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I think that in the end, you'll need to have a sort of protocol with rules that says, well, Shared, shared over all these parties, this is how we can model and predict 
for well, these patients, this care path and this capacity. Okay. Let's see, over there, there's a question over there, over there. Start in that corner, we'll get to you and to you. Okay. Yeah. I'm an uh, IT architect, so I see IT solutions for this. Uh, however, what is, uh, according to you, the added value of uh, a blockchain in this whole story? Hmm. <laughs> Very good. Well, we've also discussed this. So, and this is uh, also something we saw in previous challenges. In the end, also for the patient, uh, if you would like to apply blockchain, one of the best things it provides or can provide is transparency. Uh, so seeing how your data is used uh, and in the end, uh, yeah, so for example, we, we talked earlier, one of the, the things you do not want is that your data is being used by, for example, insurance companies uh, and without good reasoning. Um, and uh, yeah, from your own experience, of course, uh, yeah, that becomes really vague then. If you do not know uh, and you provide the data for such a purpose as this, you would beneficially also like to see uh, how the data is being used over by all these different parties. And I think blockchain can, can support that. Can I add something? We are also looking for a AY um, solutions because we want to predictive aspects in our smart tool as well. Um, for example, if you expect a flu epidemic, can we predict the capacity in two or three weeks? Or if you have a patient with a broken hip in your emergency department, can we predict whether he will be able to go to a first aid residence in two weeks? Will this first aid residence be available for him? So the predict predictive aspect is also crucial in this smart tool. AI, okay. Let's see. Ladies first. <laughs> Ladies second, that is, now. <laughs> you, you already had your hand. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was just wondering, because I can imagine there are similar regions throughout Europe who face the same problems as you. Mm -hmm. Have you contacted them? How they solve the same problems in critical care you have? Because there are a lot of villages in countries like... Portugal. Or whatever, Germany. Yeah. Hey, yeah. So. Um, I received some data from uh, a region in Britain and a region in Australia. Um, those are both regions that had a critical point in their healthcare and they didn't have any option then to go forward with some data uh, dashboards. So they will be available in a toolkit for the teams that apply. Okay, but I, I don't think that was what I meant. <laughs> they, I, I, I'm not, I haven't read about it, so that's something that will be received to the, from the teams. I think your we main question is, did you look at other initiatives and in learn from countries. them? That, learn from yes. them because I think there are similar regions in Europe with, who face the same problems with critical care because they don't have enough hospitals or caretakers in their region. So I, I thought maybe they have It's nice open solutions. for you. It's, uh, it's not yeah. something we've looked into yet. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Thanks. Good question. Do you know of a similar region? No, I'm not from healthcare, but I, it's true. It will make sense as well. Um, so, uh, so another question. You say that 40% uh, of the, the uh, patients could mm -hmm. be helped by uh, somebody else. Uh, could you give an example? And I mean, I understand that you need the information if that uh, somebody else is also available. So what kind of uh, caretakers are we, are we talking about? And uh, we see a lot of people at the emergency department because they don't have a GP anymore. So we're the first place to go. Uh, and Friday between 5 and 6, it's very busy at the emergency department as well because a lot of GPs will send elderly people, uh, people that should go to psychiatry, but there are no beds. Uh, we had a lot of cuts in the mental health care. Uh, so we need, more, we need more GPs and we need more places uh, where people can go because of uh, mental issues instead of uh, purely physical issues. Housearts. Housearts. But are the resources, uh, are there any resources available uh, or is it just there are no GPs available anymore? So, I mean, d d um, uh, the GP question is very, is a difficult one because it's not a very popular re region to come and work as a GP. 
I think we should invest more in, that's what you said, uh, home care uh, as well. Uh, if we have more home care and uh, create stable situations at home and replace the medical care we deliver in hospitals to, to homes of people, that would help a lot as well. But the GP problem, that's a whole different story. There's a question here. Yeah. <coughs> so, um, what you just said about uh, more or less consolidating dashboards. Um, so, hospitals give their own input on the availability of the beds they have available. Uh, after which you said that some hospitals might want to uh, put misinformation in there. So, you basically get a garbage in, garbage out principle in which there is no authentication of the data that comes in. Wouldn't it be an idea to start using blockchain to verify the data that's being put into those systems by you know, uh, making sure that, that um, data or in-checking procedures from hospitals are being timestamped, after which you know for sure what the availability is, and then you can put it in a dashboard. But also, I don't see really the point of consolidating those. Is there any thoughts over that? Uh, from a technical perspective, then you'll need to make sure that yes, the source is reliable and that anything that's put into that source, well. I mean, if you're checking the patient, which you always need to do because of well, legal or regulatory reasons. If, oh, sorry. Yeah. If you would um, make those registrations, you know, uh, anonymous, but also directly placed into a dashboard in which there's no human interference, you kind of lose the necessity for you know having a malicious actor at all in the process. Yeah, I agree. So uh, I mean, yeah, if this is also really, I'm not sure in, uh, to what extent this um, is a very large problem of the uh, whole challenge. Um, but in the end, yeah, you do need to make sure that the data that is there is, of course, of enough reliability. Um, and that's also what I would like, what, what, from my perspective, what would be interesting to see is how you would actually also extract data. So if you make a protocol available for all these parties to plug into, what kind of API do you facilitate for that? Yeah, well, I think with uh, what you're saying about, uh, I think it's 240, the new solution. I mean, you can, yeah. you can have built in by design that there's blockchain, a blockchain layer underneath it, which safeguards the data that's being put in. But there's no real reason not to put an anchoring service between an existing ERP system, which would eliminate the need to completely shift systems, but just push that verified data through your ERP system via API to a decentralized layer, yeah. which can be consolidated into an actual dashboard. So yeah, it might well, be an uh, idea to add that to the challenge, because I think that's the whole origin of the, of the, of the issue. Yeah, good, good Great. suggestion, yeah. Thank you. Um, oh, wait. There's, there's a microphone coming. Okay. Um, I have a question about the remark that it's not all about the beds. Because uh, uh, you said we can predict how many beds we have, but it's not all about the beds. So what kind of data do you have? And what, um, in Dutch, it calls a, it's called a beslissingsschema. Decisions. What's <laughs> that? No, if it's not about the bed, what, what kind of, uh, uh, yeah, other criteria? Other criteria to, to you have to to, to say, decide okay, the where to put can the patient come here, or decide if it's the right spot to bring the patient. Yeah, because it's, uh, I think it's about triage, uh, first. But that's not part of the challenge. That's the part of the pilot, uh, the triage and uh, the care yeah. path. So. Um, the challenge only focuses on the capacity, and um, the problem About there the is um, capacity can be measured in different ways for the different acute care points. Yeah. So the capacity in a hospital is beds, but the capacity for a GP isn't beds. So what but is the, bed the definition? Is the people around the beds, the doctors. Exactly. So um, for example, also for home care, um, your capacity is the staff that's nearby. Uh, yeah. The definition of capacity is different for each of the care points and how do you get all those definitions together in one smart tool that's also a challenge for the teams question. question over here since we're talking about bringing all those organizations and their data together in order to uh, ideally sort of optimize everything so that every patient gets the, the right care path right mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm just wondering, um, do those care providers uh, have the same incentive? Um, I'm asking because they probably don't. They they have they operate under very different circumstances. Like uh, it was mentioned at the beginning that the Omelander Hospital is just overloaded. There is too much, right? So you would have an incentive, I would imagine, as an orga organization to send patients somewhere else. So um, I'm I'm trying to come up with an example of. Um, of a case in which those incentives of different care providers would not be aligned, so that they would maybe even try to compete with each other. Um, the reason why I ask this is if we build a system that sort of supports everyone, some organizations will start playing the system in one way or another, willingly or unwillingly. So what threats uh, could, you, could you think of in terms of organizations actually having different objectives and sort of competing with each other to achieve them? Um, I will be very honest, our hospital uh, uh, does the human uh, interference where you were talking about, we will say sometimes we don't have any beds because we're understaffed. Mm -hmm. So we do have beds, but we don't have uh, the doctors and the nurses to take care of the patient that should be in that bed. Um, so th the fear I have is that we can build the technical solutions for everything, but if we don't uh, speed up the pace, uh, uh, the speed up uh, our staff and the people that have to take care of the people in those beds, uh, then we have a huge problem. So it's not just the capacity, it's also the ability to use this capacity. Yes. Yeah. 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 Are, are there yeah. In incentives? Like th this is about not having enough staff and kind of lying about that you don't have enough beds. I didn't Would say lying. No, lying <laughs> is not the right frame. I said less honest. <laughs> being less honest. <laughs> Um, are, are there any other like um, prefers uh, pickles, prefers incentives to to like game the system? I think th this is what you're. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Maybe also yeah. The the uh, prefers prickle. Yeah. In English. Hmm. <laughs> 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 That's a. We're still being paid for uh, uh, keeping people sick. That's very uh, over there, but that's the way we fund our system. So if we can change the finance, if we are, if we will be paid to uh, uh, prevent people from getting sick and stay as long as they can be healthy, and that's in the northern part of Holland, uh, a very big challenge. Um, if we would be financed for healthy people, uh, then we wouldn't have, have this problem at all. Mm -hmm. But that's a more political... So the more care you provide, the more money you make. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. That's a good question. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll here. Uh, based on your question, so... Please a use a the mic. Yeah. Um, so the challenge is about capacity. So underlying, the challenge is about the more money. Or am I completely wrong with that? Because, or can we also tackle problems that are uh, for the underlying, for the political aspect, or for the mindset? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the challenge is about capacity for the people that should go to the hospital. Which is money. No, because we can make money of all those people that shouldn't go to the hospital. Uh, but we think, and that's our moral obligation, we have to... Uh, let people stay at home or at their nursing home uh, if they're not have to be at our place. Uh, we're not that corrupt. Uh, <laughs> yes. But it's about capacity for those people that should be in the hospital. I'm giving you a workout. Do I need it? No. <laughs> no. Um, first one little remark that yeah. ideally the system shouldn't be used by the organizations themselves just to relieve their capacity but um, by the mouth uh, yeah. hmm? <laughs> about at the dispatch, dispatch um, who decides where the patient will go so um, they are in need um, of the capacities and they are uh, yeah <laughs> um, they shouldn't be um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, responsible, reliable, hmm? responsible. They should be reliable about the capacities and be honest and transparent um, about the capacities of the um, organizations added into the system. Right. 
Um, my question is about uh, more for the end user, like what the usability of it is, because I know there are also governments have a tendency to build apps and things that they think will be useful and they're badly designed or they don't really work. And so what's the, you know, design really like usability aspect of it look like? That's I, interests me the most, I suppose. Totally up to you. Okay. It doesn't even have to be a dashboard. If you think you have some design that's even better, be our guest. <laughs> You need this guy. Yeah. <laughs> we need to convince him to come. Yeah, Jacob. Um, um, blockchain is, uh, amongst others, about uh, uh, non-repudiation, non onweerlegbaarheid in Nederlands. Oh. Um, that's a thing that you can do. Um, uh, I can imagine that it would be very nice to um, sort of prove by the system that we're building here, uh, prove to the government who is cutting budgets, who is cutting uh, uh, resources and so on, to prove that things go wrong, the, to prove that um, and so on. Huh? All the things that you're worried about, you can prove because there is this onweerlegbaarheid and non-repudiation in the system. Visibility. Yeah, visibility, uh, uh, it, it makes it clear Experience. where things go wrong because there's only one schema left, for example, huh? which is quite bad and we can kick ass with our results. I like to do that. Yeah. We have another another uh, one. For, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we do. Two more questions, and then we'll round up. Yeah, and then. Uh, I have some practical uh, question. I heard uh, the most uh, meet is on Friday uh, at five. Why can't you ask the GP to uh, send in on Thursday so you have the less uh, half of the <laughs> patients then? Uh, because people, uh, ordinary people in the northern part of Groningen, of the Netherlands, come on Friday. Because they think, oh shit, the weekend is coming and my mother is delusional and we have to do something. Or my child is... Uh, a lot of worries start at Friday. And uh, we always say at the hospital, the darker it gets, the more worried people will be and the more the phone will ring. So, it is, so, so it's, it's not about a G, it's not about the house or a GP no. holding back patients and sending them on Friday afternoon. No. They come to the GP on Friday. Okay. Last question. So we talked a lot about how things should work and how is the capacity assigned today? How does it look like? Does somebody shuffle an Excel sheet and says, oh, there is a bed. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the process? Simply by phone calls. Yeah. We call Between each whom? other between the hospitals asking for capacity and it's really time consuming. That's the only way it's working right now. So that's, that's, that's also the human factor in it. You can say yes or no who will know the truth behind it. So that's uh, right. the problem we are facing now. And that's especially very hectic if you have a heart attack or giving birth, if we have to call between hospitals. Mm -hmm. Why specifically for those two? Be because of, because the of a heart attack, you're dying if yeah. you're not getting help quick yeah. enough. <laughs> and giving birth without help is also yeah. a thing. I haven't tried, but I can imagine. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> Okay, so we have two more minutes. Is there anything you would like to say? Because we now have like this group of possible contestants. Could you uh, say anything to... Of course, we already have said a lot, but is there anything you would like to, to add to what you said to inspire them to come? Please it's join. Please <laughs> join. That's a good question. Yeah, it's about... Acute care, the at the right time, at the right place, by the right people. And we, we will hope provide you nice drinks, healthy snacks, a good evening program, uh, <laughs> whatever you want. <laughs> no, and I think uh, what, what I would really like to add is we have already a lot of exp uh, experience with uh, not just doing a hackathon, but really guiding those teams afterwards and hooking them up with the right stakeholders to actually make it work and uh, to, to, to scale this up to something that... that Can I add yet, sir? Yeah. Um, once the hackathon finishes, um, the project isn't finished yet because the pilot is um, here for two years. So you can add into one of the work groups that has so much initiatives and so much um, problem-solving skills for our acute care in the North Netherlands. 
make an impact. Ja. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do yourself a favor and join this group. So, with, with that, I would like to round up. And if there's any more questions, just uh, uh, come up here and, uh, and ask us. Thank, Thank you, you all very much. Yeah.